At this point in Minecraft's history, players have recreated almost every retro video game. Tetris, Breakout, even Super Mario Bros have all been made with just vanilla redstone. And while many of these games have stayed pretty faithful to their original counterparts, I would argue that Atari's original Pong, the simple game where you just hit a ball back and forth, has never been done quite right. In this video, I'll explain why that is and show you how I made the first faithful Pong recreation with just redstone, including all the math and clever engineering along the way. Don't get me wrong, it's not like no one has ever recreated Pong before. If you just google redstone Pong, you'll find hundreds of builds with two paddles and a bouncing ball. In fact, Pong was one of the first redstone games ever made, all the way back in April of 2011. So why do I think none of these are a faithful recreation? Well, in most people's builds, the ball only moved in four possible directions, whereas in the original, it moved in a lot more different ways. Now to be clear, no one lied by saying they made Pong. At the end of the day, Pong is mainly about two paddles, a ball, and scoring a point when the other person misses. But from a strictly design perspective, this small difference made these builds significantly simpler than the original. Let's take a closer look at how the ball moves in most people's builds. At the start, the ball has some initial velocity. This can be broken down into an X component and a Y component, where placing them tip to tail gives back the original thing. On every frame, the ball continues in the direction of its velocity until it hits something. If it hits the floor or the ceiling, then the Y component gets flipped, and the X component stays the same. And if the ball hits one of the paddles, then the X component gets flipped, and the Y component stays the same. This is why most people's ball only moved in four different directions. No matter how many collisions there were, the X and Y components kept flipping between two states each, which created four possible combinations. So when it comes to redstone, you might guess that people stored the X and Y components somewhere, and maybe used some detectors on the sides to flip them. But thanks to a cool trick, most of them were actually way simpler. Notice that if you track how the ball moves through time, it always eventually comes back to where it started and repeats. This means you can think of the ball as being on one giant loop, like a race car track, but just way twistier. So in most builds, the actual implementation was just one long redstone loop for the ball to travel on. Of course, most builds also had circuits for the paddles and a scoring system, but the main ball bouncing circuit was typically just a single redstone wire. Now let's compare this to the original Pong. In the original, collisions against the floor or the ceiling still just flipped the Y component and kept X the same. That part is actually accurate in most people's builds. But when it came to paddle collisions, Atari made it more interesting. It still flipped the X component, but then it created a new Y component based on where the ball hit the paddle. Hitting the middle created zero component, whereas hitting closer to the top or bottom created a stronger positive or stronger negative component. This makes way more combinations than just four, and more importantly, it means that the fancy one wire trick is impossible. The ball is not guaranteed to follow any kind of looping pattern, so the only way to build it with redstone is with actual velocity circuits. So that was my goal. I wanted to build redstone pong just like the real hardware, and have it behave as close as possible to the original version from 1972. As usual, I started with the display. To be as accurate as possible, I looked up what the resolution of Pong was, and I was surprised to learn that it didn't really have one. As M. Randish explains, Pong didn't have a bitmap or a CPU. It was driven by chips that synthesized an analog video signal, so all I could do was keep the ratios the same as best I could. The original display had a 4x3 ratio, so I started by building an 85x64 screen out of 2x2 lamp pixels. Not insanely big for Minecraft, yet still big enough to draw fine details. Then I put in some redstone blocks to make the dashed line in the middle, and I marked out where the two scores would be as well. I also made a quick texture pack to turn redstone lamps black and white, which made it look almost exactly like the original. From there, I started working on the paddles. My first idea was to build a giant glass tower plugged directly into the edge of the screen. That way I could display a paddle by just powering the tower. This was a good start, but it made the paddle a bit too tall. The original paddle to height ratio was about 1 to 16, so with my height of 64, I needed the paddle height to be exactly 4 pixels instead of the 7 it currently was. So to fix this, I used a trick with comparators on the inputs. By subtracting from them, it weakened the signal just enough to be exactly 4 pixels tall. Tricks like this are not always obvious, and it can be hard to build an intuition for them. But by far the fastest way to build that engineering intuition is the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online platform that can turn anyone into an engineering person. Out of all the educational websites out there, I like Brilliant the best because they focus on understanding above all else. All of their courses have interactive activities that are all clearly designed to not just cover knowledge, but teach it in a way that actually builds intuition. One great example of this is their new course called Algorithmic Thinking. This course takes you through all the foundational logic you need to solve problems with computers, and every step of the way, Brilliant guides you with hands-on activities until each concept makes sense, from learning basic pseudocode all the way to making optimization algorithms. 
I also like Brilliant because instead of putting everyone at the beginning, they put you on a customized learning track. You'll start at the right level based on your background, and then Brilliant will design completely personalized practice sets and reviews for you. Engineering can be confusing and hard, but it doesn't have to be. With Brilliant, you'll build genuine understanding and start clicking with concepts you used to struggle with. To learn for free with Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash mapbatwings, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's also giving you guys 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. With the size fixed, I was ready to start moving the paddle, and I had two main ideas for how to do it. The first was to use a shift register. I could make a locked repeater for every possible paddle position, and then just quickly unlock them and relock them to shift up or shift down. The second was to use a coordinate system. I could instead put in a binary number for the height, and then use a decoder to figure out where to output it. Having an actual number for the height felt like it would be useful later on, so I ended up building the second option, which you can see here with this giant decoder. If I input 9 for example, the paddle moves up to the exact 9th highest pixel. Now I just needed a circuit to automatically make this count up or count down. I've actually already built that exact same circuit for Pac-Man, so all I had to do was yoink it and hook it up. When I flip this lever, it counts up, and when I flip this lever, it counts down. After that, I copied it to the other side using World Edit, and I hooked them up to a platform with two pressure plates on each side, allowing both players to easily move their paddles by just moving forwards or backwards. Now it was time to add the ball. Given the size of my screen, I decided the best size for the ball was probably just a single pixel. So to display that pixel, I made a huge XY decoder behind the screen. This allowed me to plot the ball by putting in an XY position. For example, if I put in 5, 7, you can see it puts the ball 5 over and 7 up. From there, it was time to get the ball moving. Remember, unlike most other builds, I couldn't use the fancy one wire trick. My ball needed to have a real velocity with an X component and a Y component. These components are ultimately just numbers that describe the horizontal and vertical movement. If the X component is negative one and the Y component is three, that means the ball is moving one pixel left for every three pixels up. Or if the components are two negative seven, that's two pixels right for every seven pixels down. So using a pair of binary adders, I made a circuit that takes in the components and continuously adds them to the position. If I input three for X and five for Y, it makes the ball move three over and five up over and over again. And yeah, now I could put in any two components and watch the ball move accordingly. Now for the fun part, collisions. To try to not overwhelm myself, I started with just the easier collisions, hitting the floor or the ceiling. Remember, all these do is flip the Y component and leave X alone. So using a cool trick, I made this nice little flipping circuit. For any number you put in, it'll multiply it by negative one in just a few ticks. Putting in three, for example, gives negative three, or putting in negative one gives one. Then I attached this to the Y component, and I made it so that it only triggered when X was zero or 63, AKA when the ball hit the floor or the ceiling. I tested it out, and it seemed like it was working fine. When I put the ball near the ceiling with velocity one one, it bounced off perfectly. But when I tried it with velocity one two, it exposed a problem that I definitely should have seen coming. Any Y component greater than one can just skip over the detection line and cause the ball to never bounce. Obviously this never happens in the original, so I started comparing my circuits to Atari's to try to find out where I went wrong. That's when I learned that in the original, the velocity components were always fractional. In other words, a velocity like 1, 2 simply didn't exist. Instead, it would be something like 1 fourth, 1 half. Same direction, but now it makes a nice connected path. So in Minecraft, I just made my velocity system also use fractions. Now the ball never skipped any lines, so my floor and ceiling collisions could finally work properly. Then came paddle collisions. To detect a paddle collision, I first had to make sure that the ball was in one of these two columns. So I built a check to see if X was one or 83. Then I had to make sure it was at the right height as well. So I built a pair of subtractors to do ball Y minus paddle Y. If the result was zero, one, two, or three, that meant the height matched one of the four paddle pixels. After that, I was finally ready to change the velocity. Remember, paddle collisions change the velocity in two ways. They flip X and then create a new Y based on where the ball hit the paddle. Flipping X was at least pretty easy because I could just use the same flipping circuit from before. But creating a new Y presented yet another unexpected problem. The original paddle had eight different sections, each creating a different Y. Well, except for the middle two, which both created zero. Problem was, my paddle only had four pixels, so I couldn't really do more than four sections. But after thinking for a few hours on this, I ended up finding a really nice workaround. I was using fractional numbers now, so why not just look at the real position and round it to the nearest half pixel? Then when the ball hits the paddle, I could still treat it as eight different sections, even though you can't see them on the screen. So yeah, using this strategy, I went ahead and made the circuits for creating a new Y component. And now, all types of collisions were officially working. At this point, everything was coming together so nicely. There were only a few features left to build. In the original, the ball actually speeds up as there are more and more paddle hits. 
normal speed for the first three hits, but then one and a half times speed at four to 11 and two times speed at 12 or more. So using this binary counter from LRR number eight, I just made it count the hits and speed up the clock accordingly. All that was left to do now was the scoring system. When a player scores, they should get one point and the ball should be served to the loser with the same velocity it just had. So using some ROMs from LRR number nine, I put in the seven segment displays and made them increment when the ball hits the opposite column. And in either of those cases, I just made it so that the ball gets teleported back to the middle column. Now in the original, the game ends when a player reaches either 15 or 11, controlled by a physical switch. So naturally, I made a virtual switch to do the same thing, flip it up to play to 15 or down to play to 11. With that, all the hardware was finished. I playtested some games, which unsurprisingly revealed a few more bugs, but after those were fixed, I officially called it done. This ended up being such a fun challenge, and I'm really proud of the final result. It looks great, it's genuinely super fun to play, and it has every feature of the original. As always, there's a world download in the description if you want to try it yourself. I hope you learned something, I hope you enjoyed. Peace out guys. Thank you.